We are interviewing uh, Mr. Uh, Mitchell Morse at uh, the Kingston, New York Armory. It is April 11, 2001. The interviewer is Michael Agee. Videographer is uh, Eric Stein. Mr. Morris, where'd you grow up? In Brooklyn, New York. The infamous place. And uh, you spent most of your early life in Brooklyn? All of it. All of it. Until it was time to enlist. What year was that? Um, I actually went in early in 44. I was in college at the time. And uh, being as young as I was, I went into ASTRP, Army Specialized Training Reserve Program. And I spent three months in Princeton. Had a lousy record there since it was mostly science, which was not my, not my bag. Mm -hmm. And from there I went into basic training. Went into basic training April 9th, 1944. Where were you when uh, you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, yes, I was with a friend in Brooklyn. We both used to breed tropical fish and we were waiting for one of his fancy guppies to give birth and we were sitting looking into his fish tank when we heard it come over the radio. What went through your mind at that time, Drew? Well, it seemed like total insanity to me. Totally unexpected and a real shocker. Mm -hmm. And at that point you were in, you were in college? Yep. Yeah. Okay. What, uh, you enlisted in 44. Uh, where'd you have, where'd you go to basic? Fort Bragg. North Carolina. Well, what was that like? Well, in case this is seen out of New York State, I'm not going to say what it was like. It was pretty awful. Why? Aside from the physical rigors, which I was not used to, I couldn't get used to the attitude Southerners had towards anybody who was not from the South. And my biggest shock was when one of the guys I was taking basic training with, it apparently had owned a dry cleaning store, and he enthusiastically told us the great joy he had when some black guy came in and wanted to know where his clothing was and wasn't ready and the guy said something about it and he took such great pleasure in physically throwing him out. And then going into bus stations and seeing the uh, isolated restrooms and the way it was just quite a culture shock for somebody from New York. <clears throat> and uh, basic went for about how long? I think it was three months, three or four months in those days. I don't remember. I think it was three months. Okay. And once you got out of basic, uh, where did you go next? Well, during basic, I decided it was much better to be an officer than an enlisted man. So I applied for OCS. Before that, the government had started a new program whereby um, they were taking 10 people from throughout the services all over the country into West Point directly, you know, without the usual senatorial approval and recommendations and so on. So I applied for that. I think that's even better. Four years in college, by then the war will be over and I'll spend a couple extra years in the Army and be on my way. Well, I almost got through to it. Got through, I was, I was narrowed down to the last handful in, in Fort Bragg and then probably because I was a smart ass in those days, I was not accepted. So the next best thing was to get to be an officer another way. So I applied for OCS and was accepted and went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Benning School for Boys. What was that like? That was tough physically, very, very rigorous. Particularly I was 18 at the time and most of the guys had been in the Army for some time. <clears throat> A lot of them had been in combat overseas as enlisted men come back to try to get a commission. And I was if not the youngest, one of the handful of the youngest in the entire class. Started a class of 300 and graduated a class of 150. Was it uh, good training? Exceptional. Mm -hmm. physical, physical training was excellent and whatever training you can give for leadership was excellent too, although I don't think that's something you can train somebody for. <clears throat> Either it's within or it's not. Mm -hmm. And after your, uh, your stint there, well, Spent a year in Camp Gordon, Georgia. That was hard work, a lot of work, but that turned out to be fun. Mm -hmm. 
I enjoyed that a great deal. That was an infantry school? Yeah. Infantry training. Inf OCS was infantry. Infantry training in Camp Gordon, which is now Fort Gordon. And I used to take a particular delight. I weighed about 135 pounds. And one of my good buddies was six, two or three months larger. And he, I couldn't believe it. I was giving classes in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he used to attack me from the rear with a knife, and I would flip him over my shoulder, much to the surprise of all the trainees, and much to my surprise as well. <laughs> And uh, after that training? Well, the war was still on in the, in the Far East and the islands. And I was, I received orders to go overseas to fight in, the, you know, these various god-awful island battles. <clears throat> I got to Fort Ord in California. And uh, they give you a last minute in physical inspection before you ship. I'd had my shipping orders already. And they discovered I had a hernia maybe from carrying a footlocker in one hand and a duffel bag over the other, whatever the reason was. So they pulled me out, stuck me in the hospital, operated on me, and by the time I was out of the hospital, the war was over. <coughs> so instead of going into combat, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> getting over a fierce cough. I'm gonna have to wait a second. <coughs> and I spent about, uh, 10 months, 10 or 11 months in Japan. Oh, now you were in the, part mm. of the occupation forces. Exactly. What was that like? That was an experience, an education beyond belief. <coughs> First of all, to discover that the Japanese were not the horrible people, the, the everyday man in the street, was not the horrible person we were trained to believe. We went over there, obviously to civilize them. That's what we were trained to do, to go over there and teach them what the world was all about. But the average Japanese was a very kind, gentle soul. And um, I liked most of them. And I had a very <clears throat> close feeling for the country at large and the culture at large. And being, being a believer in reincarnation, I was kind of figured, well, maybe I'd been there in a previous lifetime. And you were over as a first or second lieutenant? Second lieutenant. I didn't get to be first lieutenant until they kicked me out of the army, or, or not kicked me out, but finally got out of the army. Mm -hmm. it was, I had nev never got promoted while I was in Japan because I was a bit of a cutoff. And when I was due to be promoted, Colonel and I didn't get along too well. So he always passed me by. Excuse me. What was your, what was your job? Well, at first, this is, this is the fascinating part. At first, I was a company commander of an infantry platoon. And um, it was the um, 34th Regiment of the 24th Infantry Division. And being where we were, in order to facilitate the cleaning of the men's clothes, there was a quartermaster mobile laundry detachment, which used to service the entire regiment clean the clothes and so on. Well, the lieutenant in charge of the quartermaster detachment had to go home on emergency furlough. His mother was in the hospital, severely ill. So they needed somebody to take over temporarily. Well, being in the infantry here in quartermaster, I immediately volunteered. And being the most recent arrival to the regiment, I was put in charge. I stayed right on the same base, and I was put in charge. And the name of this, give you an idea of the time, it was the 354th Quartermaster Laundry Detachment Mobile Parentheses Colored. That was part of the official, de official designation. Mm -hmm. So here I was, commanding officer of a laundry detachment <laughs> with all black guys, or I guess, no, I don't know what you say nowadays. In those days it was colored, now it's black or Afro-American. In any event, I had this crew. I got along famously with, I used to play poker with them, I didn't drink, being just, we officers had a liquor ration. And I got a certain amount of beer and a bottle of booze every once in a while, which I gave to my guys, so they thought I was sent from heaven. And that was the time when um, I acquired, at the age, I was 19 at the time, I acquired my Japanese houseboy, Yukihiro 
Maeda. And <clears throat> he was 16, I was 19, and but I was you know, the big honcho. He drove me crazy. He'd shine my shoes, he'd hold my shirt while I dressed, and I almost dropped him a couple of times because when I got out of the shower, he insisted upon tallying me down. And this was just too much. Couldn't stand it. But he was absolutely adamant about it. And during that period of time, a good buddy of mine, who was still with the infantry regiment I had been with, he and I were on a, at a track meet at a nearby town, meeting with another regimental track team. <clears throat> and we arrived there by train, and in the train station there were a number of Japanese war orphans just sort of living in the station, waifs, you know, with distended stomachs from not eating enough and so on. So when we arrived, all we had with us with some chewing gum and candy, which we gave to two of these little boys. And two days later, we came back, or the next day, I don't remember exactly. <coughs> there they were, chewing on the same chewing gum. So we, through an interpreter, we found out that they had no parents. They were lost during the war. So we took them back with us. And they lived with us for many months until we both came back to the States. And I thought I brought a couple of pictures to show you. When we got them all scruffy, distended stomach, and then we fattened them up, fed them up, had little suits made for them by the local tail, and they lived with us for a while. So that was an exciting experience. And my other son, who in those days was not my other son, I gave him the nickname of Jocko. Jocko not only took care of me, he took care of the two little boys. So that was an experience unto, its, unto itself. And <clears throat> 41 years later, my daughter became a member of what the Japanese called JAT, the JET program, Japanese English Teachers. She went over there. She had been teaching English as a second language in Manhattan, in the World Trade Towers. And she found out about this opportunity. They, they were recruiting teachers from all over the world, but they wanted native speaking English so that the children could learn the vernacular, not just stiff formal textbook English, which most of the teachers taught and spoke themselves. They got them from US, England, New Zealand, Australia, all the English-speaking countries. So she had been over there about a year at the time when we decided to go over and visit. And we were touring here and there. And I arranged the schedule. So we go to the old town where I had been when Jocko was my house boy. And I remembered his address from them because for several years after I came back, we had corresponded. <coughs> and then, of course, with time, we lost track of one another. I remember that. I still remember the address to this day, 569 Yashiro. So we took a detour to Meiji, and we had a Japanese interpreter. And we went to the town hall to try to find him. Really a remote possibility. 569 Yashiro had burned to the ground years ago. And there's now a gasoline station there. But the people at the home office in um, MH were incredible. The chief of the whole village hall, town clerk or whatever he was, had three people going through all the old records. They traced down everybody who had lived on that block at that time, called them all up, served us tea in between, fussed over us, and um, about two hours later, one of them located Jocko's brother, where he lived. Gave us the phone, and we left there. We were, you know, really excited about the possibility of finding him. And we couldn't get through to the brother for some time. I don't know, family must have been out working. Finally, <clears throat> late in the day, about three, four o'clock, we got through, the, using the interpreter, of course, we got through to his brother's house, spoke to his sister-in-law, and got his telephone number. Hooray, my God, it looks like we're getting close to finding 42 years later. So, uh, couldn't, re couldn't reach him. Left the message earlier with his sister-in-law at the hotel we were staying at, which I think was Osaka. And uh, police calls there that I had to leave the following morning and I didn't want to be this close without seeing him. Well, lo and behold, we don't hear from all afternoon we're in our room getting dressed, go down and have dinner. 
and the uh, phone rings, and he called up. I'm, I'm jumping up and down with joy. I get all teary just thinking about it. And uh, it turns out he was downstairs in the lobby with his wife. So we had a year. Turn out the thing on. So we went downstairs and had a fantastic reunion. We had dinner together. And his English, although not perfect, was excellent. Mm -hmm. And he had been from a, I found out later on, from a well-established family. His father had been a Japanese military officer. His brother, older brother, had gone to the military academy. And Jocko had been destined to go to military academy before the war ended. And he ended up with me instead. So after that, we were in touch with him on a regular basis. And a year later, my daughter married a Japanese high school English teacher. And if anybody would have told me when I was there earlier that I'd have a Japanese son-in-law and two Japanese grandchildren, I'd have them committed in a straight shank. Because remember, I went over there to civilize those people, I and everybody else. So he came to the wedding. He was part of our side of the family. I don't know, you probably don't know, in Japanese weddings, even if they have 500 people, the actual ceremony, there are only 15 people from each side of the family, maximum of 30 people, no matter how many people are waiting outside. So Ellie and I were there, my son was there, a Japanese business friend who had done business, was doing business with in New York, an art dealer. Uh, he was also from our side of the family, and Jocko was there with his daughter. Oh, no, with his daughter and wife. His wife and one, both daughters were in college at the time. And we went back the following year, the birth of our first grandson, and Jocko was there again, bouncing my grandson on his knee, and uh, like, a, like an uncle, perhaps. So that, uh, that story had a very happy ending. And of course, ever since then, We've been going back. See, in the past 12 years, we've been there about 16 times. Totally, unex totally unexpected, as they say. When I was there, if anybody would have suggested the possibility to me of what would have happened years later, either I'd had myself committed or them committed, more likely now. Ever learned anything about the two waifs? No. As a matter of fact, Jocko had been in touch with them for some time. Apparently, one of them had been adopted by a family, and the other one ran away. He, I, I know just which one to do. Big Joe and Little Joe. Little Joe was the obstreperous one. He's probably the one who ran away. But I could never, never could trace him down. Now, you were uh, assigned to, to this laundry detail. Yeah. <laughs> the only um, thing I know about laundry was washing my socks and field jacket. Uh, mm -hmm. Dungarees. What, uh, what was the general morale of the unit? Well, when they were by themselves doing their job, terrific. But we were attached to a southern regiment. And we used to get monthly rations. So, so many candy bars, so many cans of beer, so many soap, this and that. And when the rations came in, everybody would get in a long line with snake tail all the way out. And the, uh, who was in, I forget who was in charge of the PX, some major from down south. And no matter how long the line was and how early they got there, he always made my guys get at the end of the line. So if there were 100 guys there and they got on the line and another 100 came, he'd make them get to the very tail end of the line. Reached the point where, um, I got into a fist fight with him over this, which you're not supposed to do with, I hate to use the term superior officer, he was inferior, he was just a higher ranking officer. And of course, my guys then became like um, members of the family. Hey, Lieutenant, you want us to get him for you? You know, they left him lying somewhere. Because nobody had ever you know, fought that battle for him before. So their morale was pretty good. As I say, when they were not encountering discrimination like that, 
And I used to, as I say, said before I took, gave them my liquor ration, beer ration, whatever it was, I used to play poker with them. And that was an experience, learning to play poker with them. I used to shoot craps with them, too. I forgot all the terminology, but some of the terminology was just great. But when you speak to the dice, that was, a, that was an experience unto itself. Total education. How long did you have this duty? This? The, the duty with the... Oh, the well... Until shortly before I came home. Um, you know, there was the point system, and you got rotated based on a number of points. <clears throat> and about a month or two before I was supposed to come home, the colonel in charge of the regiment called me up and said, Morse, we shot on training officers. I want you to train. Da -da 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 -da. I said, I'm sorry, Colonel, I can't do that. He said, I'm responsible for a half million dollars worth of equipment, and I gave him all the excuses why I couldn't do it. Well, it turned out all of a sudden that a Jeep which I had acquired several months before, this, there had been a CB outfit not too far away, and when they were disbanded and all went home, they left a lot of vehicles around. So I picked up a Jeep and a motor pool painted an OD for me and put 354th quarter mess and laundry detachment on. So I had my own vehicle. All of a sudden, the colonel was going to bring me up on court martial for stealing a Jeep, which I'd been using for months and months. It was common knowledge. And with officers, it's a general court martial, so it's serious stuff. So I had my choice of um, general court martial or spending 30 days conf confined to officers' quarters or barracks or what have you. And the 30 days went past the time we were supposed to come home. So I, I was supposed to come in about a week at, by that time, after all this nonsense was over. So I had to stay there an extra three weeks because he was, he was going to teach me a lesson, which he did. But anyhow, I had already registered to go back. I had finished two years of college before I enlisted. I was one of those precocious kids. I got into college at 15. So by the time I enlisted, just before I was 18, I'd finished two years of college. So when I went back, um, got discharged in Fort Dix. Yale, Yale, I went back to school. Because of the two years before, I accumulated enough credits for one more year. Well, you know, having gone to the credits from Princeton University and then for OCS, and they gave you credits for various things. You only had <clears throat> one year and an extra course to go <coughs> to graduate, which I did. Then I got a job, got married a year later, and married at the age of 21, married to the same beautiful lady who came in with me. That was 53 years ago. So at the age of 21, I was, had been working for a year, had graduated from college, spent 33 months in the Army. So it was a very busy youth that I spent, very productive. Well, very what productive. kind of uh, work did you go into? Well, when, I, when I started out in college, I was majoring in accounting, and, which for me was kind of strange. But in those days, you majored in school. This was post-depression. You majored and what you thought you could make a living at. So after much discussion with my parents, we decided, well, accounts always make a living. Even during the Depression, accountants made, an, made a living. And two of their close friends were very successful accounts. So I started out majoring in accounting. While I was in the Army, I realized that was not for me. So I went back to school. I switched to foreign trade. <coughs> Graduated with an... Uh, a BBA, Bachelor of Business Administration, major in foreign trade, got a job with an import-export company. Spent six years with this, with this company, and somewhere along the way decided <clears throat> that was not the way, the way I wanted to spend the rest of my life either. So then I had this uh, revolutionary idea, revolutionary for a depression baby. What would you like to do? Well, what I'd like to do is be a sculptor. Yeah, but you're not good enough to make a living being a sculptor. Well, what's next? Well, painter? No, you're not good enough to be a painter. So I did the next best thing. I decided if I couldn't sell my own paintings and sculpture, I'd try to sell somebody else's. 
So in 1953, I started the first traveling art gallery in the United States called Art Gallery on Wheels. And to do that, bought a brand new station wagon. I think it was a Chevy, 3,000 bucks. I had 1,500. I borrowed 1,500 from my folks and my in-laws. So for $3,000, we started a traveling art gallery. And I went around to different artists in Greenwich Village, mostly from Greenwich Village, and I got art on consignment. I went to a picture frame manufacturer and he gave me corner samples that I all had in big carton. <clears throat> and then there was a lot of construction going on after the war, all over Long Island, nearby Connecticut, nearby New Jersey. <clears throat> so I made flyers, and this word you may not have heard of, on a mimeograph machine. You crank them out one at a time. And I went around myself to all these new developments, and on foot, I stuck a flyer in every mailbox. And I would get calls from people, and I would go to the house, and assuming it was your house, you needed painting over the living room, I'd run in and out 10, 20 times, I'd keep holding paintings up over the sofa until you saw something you liked. You liked it? Put that aside. Then you need a, a pair of things for over here, a pair of club chairs or whatever. So I'd run back and forth again. It could be paintings, watercolors, drawings, or what have you. Found some more things. Then we'd select frames. Then two, three weeks later, however long it took to frame them, I'd come back and I'd hang them up for you. And through this, I got recommendations. Then I picked up a couple of interior designer accounts. who were good because it was steady and repeat business. <clears throat> and the station was so full you could barely see out the back. By this time I had two infants, only 18 months apart, 16, 17 months apart. And we'd drive around, Ellie was next to me, I'd be driving, she'd be in the front seat, two kids on it with all these racks and painting things bouncing around. If I had a, once we stopped for a traffic light and things kept sliding over the top, hit one of us in the back of the head, I don't remember which one. Then we started getting worried about the kids in the car. We decided, well, it's time. We're going to have to plant roots somewhere. So we picked a town which was considered an affluent town where I'd done a lot of business in the general area. And we opened up a retail shop. Once again, the unique shop was called Wall Decor. And we specialized in all kinds of things for the wall. Not just paintings and prints, planters, brackets. We'd take brackets, put little figurines on them. It could be a barometer. It could be any object of art. It could be a wood carving, it could be a carved panel from an old chest, whatever. And we do an entire wall arrangement. I had a large, oh, the first shop was huge. It was 17 feet by 45 feet, part of which was a bathroom in the back, and part of which I partitioned off to um, have a little framing shop, where if the frame was, was too big, <laughs> Literally could not move your arms. And then funds were still very scarce then. And uh, in fact, I, we covered all the walls with pegboard. And a carpenter gave me 700 bucks off the price to work as a carpenter's helper. So I worked with him for a week in, on scaffolding and so on, putting up the pegboard, and then I painted the place myself. So we did it all on a shoestring. And we opened up a couple of doors away from the only moving picture theater in town. So when people lined up at night to get their tickets, they were forced to see our windows, which were decorated and changed every couple of weeks by my talented wife. In fact, we had people from surrounding places come and copy the windows. She was so good at it. Mm -hmm. Just had a natural touch, no special training. And um, we had this big pegboard wall on wheels right down the middle of this narrow shop. And people would come in <coughs> and I would walk around with them and tell them to pick half a dozen things that they liked, whatever it was. So they'd walk around and I'd take those basic pieces, hang them up on a pegboard wall, rearrange everything, juggle everything, add additional to people. Then always, either I, if they picked enough, we'd have to eliminate certain things. If not, I would always suggest adding something to give a little punch, a clock or a bracket with a figurine on it or a sconce, whatever. And we'd work out the wall, take an order, and then 
I would make a template on the design on a wall, and if the auto was more than $150, which was a lot of money in 1954 when we opened the retail shop, I would hang it for him too. That was included in the price. So I would frame it, I would select it, arrange it, install it, hang it, and be on to the next one. But we were lucky that that panned out very well and became a growing business. Matter of fact, at the time we had figured if we could do sales of $400 a week, we could draw a salary of $75 a week, which would have been enough to live on. First week we did over $400, and we were later, we had a celebration like you wouldn't believe. And I think the second or third week I had a big decision to make. I always have hated to bargain over prices or haggle over prices. It drives me up the wall. And I knew if anybody tried to do it with me, with me I would uh, not be good at it or I would get nasty about it. So we decided from the beginning it would be a one price shop, which is important because a lot of things we sold were antique pieces and one of a kind pieces, so there was no real com basis for comparison. So I knew people were going to try to uh, haggle about prices. So we decided to be a one price shop. Second or third week we were open, I had a painting there which was $400, the sale of which would have covered the entire week's nut. Had some lady come in, had lots of money, but it was her thing not to buy something at the marked price. She started with $350, went up to $395, and I turned it down. If it was $400, what the hell did the $5 mean? But it was a question of the word getting at. This is also the kind of woman who would love to go around and tell everybody, I knocked the price down and nobody would pay what they were supposed to. So I had ambivalent feelings, but I let her walk out. And from that point on, we grew. A couple of years later, we moved on the same street down the block to a place that was about, well, this one was 1745. How many square feet would that be? About 800. Let's see, 50. if it was 50 times 17, it would be 850. So about 800 square feet. This one was 4,000 square feet. So we had a fairly sizable place. We expanded, we opened up a whole department just for mirrors, called the Mirror Atelier, had to have a fancy name. Oh yeah, that reminds me of a funny bit. On his first little store, it had an ordinary home-sized front door with a top portion was glass and bottom wood, of course. No, it was glass top and bottom. And on the bottom portion, I bought letters and applied them myself and a stick on the, on the door. Say, branches, Upper Tibet, Outer Mongolia, and Tanganyika. And some people were so literal, had such, lacking so much in sense of humor. I got a call from my father-in-law a few weeks later. A friend of his had come by. He, <coughs> <coughs> my father-in-law called up to ask, how come? I didn't tell him I had branches. He thought it was my only, only shop. So some guy without telling him where it was, he just told hey, your son always got three branches. Up in Tibet, uh, out of Mongolia, and Tanganyika. So the business went pretty well for yep. you? Yep. Matter of fact, that, when we expanded into the larger place, we eventually bought the building we were in. It was a high-rise, a few very inex inexpensive rent-controlled apartments above. Three-room apartment was renting for $40.25 a month. Anyhow, that years later, I guess in yeah, 1978 or 79, we'd, by that time, I would say better than half our business was done through interior designers. Because they would bring the clients in. And more often than not, they'd come in in advance, discuss what they want, what their requirements were. I would make all the suggestions, and then when they came in, I guess I'm giving away secrets now. When they came in, many years later, so it doesn't matter. Um, I would present my ideas as the designer's ideas. I'd say, yeah, well, Mike was in the other day, and he suggested you might like this. Might like this. So they got what they wanted. They got credit for being the creative ones and laying it all out. So they would come back. They were happy, I was happy, and the client was happy. We were all happy. So on that basis, we did grow. And then, 78 or 79, we decided to open up a showroom, expand, 
into a showroom in one of the interior design buildings in Manhattan, which we did. And then six months later, we got a call while we were at work. Building was on fire. We came racing back from the city and from a couple of miles away, you could see this tall spiral of black smoke up in the sky. And we knew that was it, down to the ground. When, and of course, I had become a co-insurer because over the years, if I get in a shipment that was worth two or three thousand dollars, I didn't bother calling up the insurance company. It wasn't enough. The, um, so little by little, these various increases in inventory occurred, and the insurance was never kept up to date. So we ended up being sixty percent co-insurers. Lost our shirts. So we're there we were back at the beginning of the end. We started the place in the city, which is only six months old, which is not yet developed into a flourishing thing. So we used to brown bag it. We'd take sandwiches into the city with us, rather than spend the money for lunch. And for dinner, we'd go out and eat at local deli. And uh, let's see, scotch was, a name brand scotch was 55 cents. Bar scotch was 50 cents. So we ordered the bar scotch. I mean, we were really squeezing. And of course, I didn't mention, at the time we had two kids in college. So that the pressure was on us financially. You didn't think I'd have enough to say? What was, uh, you have a general sense of your experience during World War II? Yes, it turned me from a smart ass boy into a man. So it was a very positive experience? Absolutely. It was miserable and it was horrible and it was rotten, but very beneficial. You, uh, what, what in general did you learn about the Japanese culture? That it was completely different than we thought it was and that the people were different. And I have the same opinion today. The average Japanese, the man on the street, is a kind, gentle, considerate soul. But the upper echelon makes corruption here seem like they're amateurs. In Japan, everything is, you know, one hand washes the other, and they take care of each other. And the average person has no, no say over it. They keep voting for the same political group for over 50 years now, and it's totally corrupt. The, everything is done for the protection of the entrepreneur, the big businessman, and uh, that's why it's been so difficult for U.S. companies and European companies to open anything up over there. They place so many restrictions, so many barriers, that they make it nigh impossible. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Morris. That was, uh... You're welcome. Sorry you ran out of tape. <laughs>